Manata Baptist Church in Singapore. Once again, Pastor Jesse Sung. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. All right, sound check. Is it all right? All right, good morning everyone and it's good to see you, uh, okay, see everyone again. Uh, I think I see uh, most of you I, I saw yesterday morning when we had our prayer meeting, all right, and it's good to see everyone back here, all right, and of course it's always great to be faithful in the house of the Lord, all right, and uh, we're glad to be here to worship God in spirit and more, just as importantly, in truth, okay. And so this morning as we begin, um, you know, uh, I thank God for the cooperation and the friendship right, that we've had right, with Maranatha Baptist Church and Independent Baptist Church of Siem Reap and uh, especially with Pastor Joel. And, uh, you know, I, I, I am very, always very encouraged by the members here, right, and, the, and by the men, right, and uh, by the resolve that you have to stand behind the Word of God. Okay? And um, and I love how this church, you're constantly learning, constantly fixing things, improving, making small changes, right? not rather than big programs. But when, as I mentioned yesterday, when I come back year after year, I can, it's, it actually accumulates to something much bigger. All right? Sometimes you're not going to see it. Maybe if you're on vacation or something and you, you come back again, you, you're going to see this, right? But I want to encourage everyone, press on, keep going, and don't let discouragement uh, s okay, um, s put derail you because it will come. Yeah. Discouragement will come, opposition will come. Right? So I want to talk about this a little this morning. Um, so let's open our Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 4. All right, Nehemiah chapter 4. I was originally going to preach about something else, but the uh, Lord also has been kind of getting my attention uh, okay, on this text. And, okay, so we're going to do this. And please pray along with me because chapter 4 was something I took about four messages to deal with. All right, and I've, I've only got one preaching slot here. Okay, so I'm really going to need the grace and power of God to deal with this. Okay, so let's do this. Um, let's all stand and we're going to read the first six verses. And we'll do this responsively. All right, I'll read the first verse and you read the next and then we'll, we'll finish up on verse six. Okay, beginning with verse one. But it came to pass that when Sambala heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. And cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. All right, and may God bless to us the reading of his word. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this morning, for uh, gathering us here, that we can be assembled even uh, as your people, and Lord, um, to come to worship you in spirit and truth. And even as we now attend even to the preaching service, I pray, Lord, that our hearts and minds will be attentive, ready to uh, receive your word. And Lord, I pray and ask for the convicting work of the Holy Spirit to just uh, deal with our hearts. I pray also for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that as I preach, that uh, it will be with the power of God and not with the power of men. And Lord, uh, help me, uh, even with, with so much that we have to deal with in this chapter, to just step aside and Lord, to let your Holy Spirit direct and take over. 
And Lord, that uh, I will minister the word of God and it will minister grace even to all who hear. And Lord, that it will build and strengthen even your, brethren, uh, your, your people here. And so Father, we thank you. We ask this in Christ's name pray. Amen. Please be seated. Now this morning, uh, we're in Nehemiah chapter 4. And very quick background, you know that Nehemiah uh, was burdened about the state and condition of Jerusalem when he heard a report from his, his, his brother and the other brethren. And as that burden became something that drove him to his knees, to a posture of prayer. Right? We don't just hear stuff and then we click like, we put you know, a sad face or whatever. It ought to drive us to our knees to where we are praying. And as Nehemiah prayed, Right? It changed him, it, 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 it transformed him, and that was something noticeable even to the king. Right? To the point he almost risked his life because uh, no, there was apparently a law that uh, no one was supposed to appear unhappy before the king. Yeah. I don't know how they do it, maybe they use drugs or something, I, I have no idea. Okay, but they, 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 so he's supposed to have happy people there. And, but that opened the door for something to happen, and he made his request, Right? He embarked on the beginning of a project where it was so large right? and possibly very open-ended that it is very overwhelming. What was that project? It was to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and the gates of the city. Those walls and the gates were, were torn down and burnt uh, during the invasion of Jerusalem when the after a siege, that the, the, the walls were breached, right? the enemies came in, they, they slaughtered, there was a mass slaughter, and to make sure that the city would never rise again, they tore everything down. Nehemiah went back, he made the journey, God provided the, the opportunity, provided the resources. Right? He, God you notice something when we are burdened about something that we need to do and the Lord opens the way you're going to see even like in chapter 1 that God will provide also the necessary authority to get things done the necessary authority the necessary resources and all that was clear he went to the city right? he uh, arrived there and then secretly went on a private survey to find out the extent of the problem. Okay? He didn't go on a conducted tour because he needed to see with his own eyes how bad the problem really was. Rather than to have the leaders show him what he needed to see. Why is that? Because he needed an honest picture. All right? And, and that was in chapter 2. Now, understand this, that uh, in dealing with anything that we're trying to build or to fix, um, we need to first begin with a very honest picture. We need to know what's really going on. And, and that flies in the face of uh, what we see today, so common, uh, the positive-only type Christianity, where you're not allowed to discuss anything negative. Now, if you can't discuss anything negative, you can't fix anything. All right, you can't fix problems. And I think the most positive thing that you and I can do is to actually fix and address problems and to be used as instruments of the Lord to build. Amen. That's right. All right, but to do that, we need to know where the needs are, yeah. right? where the problems and the issues are. And that's why we, fix, you know, we focus our time and attention on those things to know, not to complain, not to uh, prove that, wow, I know I'm better than you, I'm, I'm smarter than you, I can spot all this. It doesn't take a genius to point out problems. Let me, let me remind everyone. Okay, But it's going to take a lot more to have the resolve to work together with others to fix those problems. And that was when in chapter 2, Nehemiah then um, addressed the leaders and they mobilized and they came with one conviction to go ahead to rebuild the walls. Now, we're going to see here that uh, we'll fast forward. Chapter 3 was about uh, the rebuilding effort and uh, how the various people uh, there, as few as they were, and then the small remnant, that they came and then they started. Now, remember, the people that came together to do this building work were discouraged people. Okay? They had been living in a terrible state, which was why Nehemiah was burdened. 
right? They were in a very deplorable state, and Nehemiah understood one fact. The way to get people out of the thing, out that situation, is they need to start fixing things and start building up. Because if they don't, they remain there and they're going to keep feeling sorry for themselves. Now, many of us here uh, may find ourselves in that situation that we, we're in a bad situation and, uh, and, and uh, there's a, a problem that doesn't seem to be able to be solved, but we sit there and we do nothing. But the worst part is we start to feel sorry for ourselves. Now, they started doing this and they started rebuilding. Now, these are very small, tiny steps. But as you and I take tiny steps, they start to accumulate to be something bigger, right? Which is why I said here, in the time that we've known Independent Baptist Church of Siem Reap, uh, it's been only, I think, at the most past of what, four years or less? Okay, I've seen tremendous changes. Okay, but these are things that many of you may not notice if you are here week to week. As they started building this, the wall started coming up and they were fixing and there were breaches, there were holes, massive gaps in the, in the perimeter of the city and these were starting to join up. Now, we come to chapter 4 and there is a response and a reaction by the enemy. All right, look at verse 1. But it came to pass that when Sambala heard that we built the wall, he was wroth. All right, now, we, he was angry. All right, he was very angry. He was upset that this was happening in Jerusalem. All right, he says, and he took and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. So we see the reaction of uh, Sambal. All right, that he notice it will be he, will, he this effort will be met with opposition, and you can be sure of something that whenever the people of God are on the right track and they're moving forward, it will be met with opposition. There will be resistance. And can I say this, that the resistance is both inside and outside. Okay? Amen. Now, but can I remind everyone here that where there is resistance on the inside, they are not the enemy. Alright, with any group of people, it sometimes takes time for everyone to catch up and to be on the same page. You see that even in your own family. All right? Sometimes there's some who lack. Now, I, I learned this the hard way that uh, for us uh, back, back home, a, a major change in direction, it may take us two years. Why? Because the first six months or more, there will be some who will sit there and ignore the pastor, thinking that if they ignore whatever he's saying, he might get discouraged, he'll give up. Okay. It takes a few more months for the others to pick up and then join, join up and then get with the program and then to come alongside and then the momentum picks up and, and when you get into the second year, people start to wonder, hey, wait a minute, there's progress, there's things moving on, uh, we're seeing results, whatever, and then everyone says, I want to be part of that success. It takes time. Okay, we're dealing with people. Right? We, we are patient with family members. And we ought to be patient with one another. We ought to be prayerful also. Now, but we all see here, what was the tactic of the enemy? His reaction was such that um, one common tactic that he, uh, Sambala used was to be ridicule the people of God. He would belittle them. Right? You notice the word that he, he called them what? Sorry, we're up uh, into verse 2. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble do Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out the heaps of the notice of the rubbish that we shall burn? All right, and we see here that um, Sembala decided to react, and he had his you notice know, these people always have their private audience. All right, he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria. They love their private audience, right? Because they were all the, that audience will always tell them what they want to hear. Contrast that to Nehemiah who went and checked things out on the ground to see the reality. All right? And, and uh, I, I think there is a term for this. The people call this an echo chamber because uh, you have this big chamber and when you make a sound, it bounces off the walls and you hear what you just said. And he noticed he, he belittled them. All right? He said, well, what do these feeble Jews? You know, what is this? That's all you have, your attendance, you know? You think you're going to make a difference here? Who do you think you are? 
right? The enemy will say that. And he mocked them, right? He says, well, they fortify themselves. They're going to build up the walls as, uh, in, to defend themselves against the, the, the empire. I say, are they going to start sacrificing? Are they going to re rebuild the temple? I say, uh, will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now, take note of one thing here, this, this last part of the verse, because when the devil opposes you, right? when the world opposes you, one of the things that they will do is they are going to point out your past failure. Okay? But listen, as the people of God, understand, we may have failed and i guarantee you you will face failure in the future never allow the past failure to stop us from continuing to do what is right Amen. right there is something that we teach even to very young christians why because that past failure the con and the condemnation of the devil may make it seem like it's permanent but understand this we have a faithful savior Right? That if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Right? There is always a resetting and a way of moving forward. Now here, they made fun of them and saying, you know what, they're going to revive these stones. Right? This, this is no, these are no longer even rocks that are used for building a wall. It is just garbage. That's all it is, garbage. Right? And he was a, okay, he is an expert at ridicule. And don't forget one thing that the devil has a certain specific title. He is called the accuser of the brethren. He's good at that. Now, we're going to see here that they ridicule the work, right? Um, and if we start listening to this, sometimes we, we start believing what was said. We start listening and believing what the scorners tell us, right? Ridicule is, now ridicule is, one, one thing it's good at is that, it's, that it covers up for the fact that the opposition has no other argument. They have no other argument against what they were doing and they, all they, so the next thing they do, they just ridicule them and then they mischaracterize them. Now, I'll just take down this reference because we're not going to go there. All right, Ezra chapter 4, verse 12 to 16. Because there you're going to see uh, Sambalat actually revives an old accusation against the Jews in Jerusalem. All right, that they had intended to rebuild the walls of the city and all that, to revive this city in order to begin their rebellion against the empire. Okay, they were falsely so, and and so I just want to kind of extract one thought here that the opposition will falsely accuse you, and they will mischaracterize what you are doing. Yeah. Okay, uh, over and over again, and notice when Sambala did that before the brethren and the army of Samaria. Uh, these days, it's done all over Facebook on social media, right? they will try and prosecute you before the courtroom of public opinion. But the question you and I have to ask ourselves is, is it important? Yeah. Right? Someone, somebody has to be important to us for their opinion to be important to us. What matters is, what does God have to think? Right? What does he have to say about what we're doing? <coughs> now, you'll see that um, this, resist, this reaction by Sambalat was followed by the ridicule of Tobiah in, in verse 3. Now it says, Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he, sh he shall even break down the, their stone wall. All right? Now he joins in the fun, all right, and he questions the rebuilding effort. Now he says, well, if this little tiny fox comes up, he accidentally bumps against the wall, the wall is just, it's just going to come down. Ha, ha, ha. And everybody's slapping each other on the back and they're laughing. Okay, now, he, here you're going to see that he questions their competence and their qualification. You know what, these, these Jews, they're not good engineers. They're not going to be able to build a good wall, right? It's so puny, it's so weak, right? you know, uh, that if a fox switch just lean against the wall, boom, it's coming down. Right? What does your pastor know? Right? Uh, is, you know, does he have a 
you know, a doctorate? Is, is, is he a scholar? What does he know? And, and the, the, those accusations and the, those, that kind of mischaracterization will, will keep going on. Right? And after all, who were the ones that in chapter 3 were, did the building? Priests, ordinary people, goldsmiths, merchants, women? Didn't look like it, it was uh, much of a construction team. Right? The fire that had, was, that had already consumed the walls and the gates of the city, you know what? The limestone was already weakened by fire when the city was burned down. You know, it was a lot of hard work. They had to start pretty much from scratch. Right? But understand this that the mocking is there to discourage you. But realize also that that mocking and ridicule has no effect on you as long as you don't even take it seriously. And listen, we're not alone because when you go to John chapter 7 verse 14 to 16, you're going to see that they ridiculed Jesus for his lack of education. You realize that? John 7 verse 14 now it says, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? He didn't go to college. All right. What Bible school did he graduate from? And they say, he never learned letters. Jesus answered that and said, my doctrine is not mine, but him that sent me. And I think that's a good and legitimate uh, reply to everyone. You know what, my doctrine is not mine, but it's f that which is found in here that is built upon this book. Amos 7, verse 10 to 15, you know what, they mocked and ridiculed Amos. Alright? Why? To silence him. He was sent up to the northern kingdom to preach. And guess what? They, they made it very clear they didn't welcome him. Look at verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jer Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos had conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Right? It says, you know something? He mischaracterized Amos, the prophet, and said, you know, he is trying to f stir up rebellion and he is against the government. He had conspired against the house of Israel. He's a rebel. He's a terrorist. He says, the land is not able to bear all his words. He said, nobody can stand his preaching. For thus saith, for, for thus Amos said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall be led, shall, shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. And also, notice this: Amaziah confronted Amos. So Amaziah said unto Amos, "O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah." He said, "Go, go back to where you belong. Don't come here." He says, "And there eat bread and prophesy there." It's very interesting how. The enemy, once in a while, will expose themselves. Okay? Now, the psychologists have a term for this. They call this projection. Where, when I, what, what happens is, is I project the things that I'm doing onto somebody else when I accuse them. Watch. Okay, he says, Go, flee there, away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. And he accused Amos, basically, you are, you are preaching for bread. It's all about your belly. Just as some will accuse someone, say, you know, you're preaching, you're saying this to build a following for money for fame, for popularity. And it's amazing how many times the people who say that actually expose that that's exactly how they think. Because that's exactly what they do. And they don't like competition. And so they told Amos, go away, don't come here. All right? So don't preach for bread and, and, and hang around here. Says, but notice verse 13, but prophesy not again anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel and it is the king's corn. Amos, you're not sophisticated enough to be there to preach before the king and the king's corn. 
You don't have the finesse or the delivery style that will be suited more for the more finely tuned taste of the king. Unlike the rest of us prophets. Then answered Amos and said unto Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son. So you're right. I'm not a prophet. I'm just an ordinary believer. I hope you've got a grasp of that. I'm just an ordinary church member. I'm not a preacher's son. He said, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. You know, he, this was what Amos had to do for a living and herding the cattle was not enough for, to make a living. He had to had the side job of picking sycamore fruit. It's an ordinary guy who followed the Lord. The interesting thing about the sycamore fruit is uh, to bring out the sweetness in the fruit, it needs to be bruised. That's a nice illustration there. It needs to be bruised. All right? But here, you know, notice, that's all he was. I don't have a nice fancy background. I don't, I'm not from like three, four generations of preachers, whoever. I'm not a prophet's son. I'm nobody. But can I remind everyone here God delights in using uh, nobodies. All right? You and I worry sometimes that uh, we don't have the credentials. We don't have the influence. We don't have the reputation. But you know something? When are we going to empty ourselves and just let the Lord fill us? Here, look at verse 15. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. I think we can do a whole message just, just on this text. The Lord took me as I followed the flock. Keep being faithful. Keep going on. All right? In your corner, whatever you're doing, just as the, in chapter 3 of Nehemiah, as everyone built the wall in their own little corner. But as they joined up and you know that work linked together, that became something much bigger. So I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. Now, Amos' reply was simply this. All I'm doing is I'm following the Lord. I, he has given me right, His will. I must obey. I must obey. And it's not about your talent. It is not about your ability or your experience or how intelligent you are. It's about your submission and your obedience. All right? Don't, don't debate and argue about the rest of it because it is his problem. If he calls Amos to do this, it's up to the Lord to equip him to get the job done. And they will falsely accuse and they will say all sorts of things. And as they mock the Jews in Nehemiah chapter 4, Understand this, they're saying, look, you want to do such a big project and undertaking, you guys are not qualified, you don't have the resources, you don't have the know-how, you don't have the experience, who are you? All right? and, they, they're, and they're threatening to say, well, we're going to stand there, we're going to just laugh at all of you. I think it's more important to take God seriously as to where he's leading us than to take the world and, and the opposition seriously. Now, let's look at his response. Alright, verse 4. What was, his, what was Nehemiah's response? Prayer. He didn't post a long Facebook reply. It was prayer. The first words that Nehemiah uttered were this way. Not out there on social media. Hear, oh our God. He brought the complaint to him. As we should, each and every one of us, when we face an issue and a problem before us, you know what? Bring it before him. We sit here or we stand here on Sunday, we sing all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. 
but we don't do it. All right, how many people pray to the God of Facebook because they go out there and then they, after their prayer there and they complain instead of directing it to the Lord? All right, he says, Here, Lord, hear our prayer. All right, why? For because we are despised. But it's not just that. You notice it's not just a positive only thing. It says, And turn their reproach upon their own head. We are not going to be the ones to retaliate. But Lord, you are the one who can bring vengeance. You are the one that can set right the injustice. You, Lord, are the one that can turn that situation around, all right, confound the enemies, turn their swords upon themselves, turn their devices back upon themselves. But, Lord, we will turn to you, we will depend on you. All right, just turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. And notice, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Now that is the heart of the issue. It is not that they have provoked all those who are in Israel or Nehemiah, all that, but that they have provoked the Lord. Now, realize this. If you and I are a church that is standing for the word of God, it won't be long before you and I will have to stand contending for some very basic truths and there will be opposition right there will be those that will oppose that paul talked about the enemies of the gospel also right he talked about how uh, in his case that uh, many times he, his life was in danger because of notice false brethren and nehemiah Turned this, uh, pray in what is known as what we call an impregatory prayer. All right, concerning the enemies, to turn this, these darts and arrows of the enemies back on themselves. Over and over again, you see in the Psalms that when David prayed, you know what he asked the Lord to deal with those people. And, and by the way, he he didn't ask the Lord to deal with them in in a nice, soft, fluffy way. But it was not for him to go and do battle with them. Romans 12 verse 19 tells us, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to, unto Ra, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And people are going to turn, create all sorts of devices. All right, Proverbs 26 verse 27 says, Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein. The ones who dig a pit to set the trap for you, says they're going to be the ones that fall in, and he that rolleth a stone, it shall return upon him. And many times we want to take up this battle, uh, take up the offense and go after others and, and, and retaliate, because why? Deep down we demand justice. Right? But Nehemiah asked the Lord to deal with this. Why? Because the opposition, all right, dealing with the opposition is not the goal. Because you're going to see in the next verse, they double up on their resolve to finish the work. All right, so built we the wall, verse 6, and all the wall was joined together onto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to debate, to dispute. To wrestle with others, they had a mind to work. All right. Now picture this: so built we the wall. So they continued building the wall. They ignored this, and now we faced those battles over the last three years as a church. Okay, over in Singapore, and one of the things was very instructive in, in Nehemiah elsewhere was there were times that you have to have the wisdom to just ignore. The opposition. And can I say this? It drives them crazy. It drives them crazy for one thing. Because Nehemiah got, got this right in verse 6. Why? Because the more they stir up the noise, the more they okay, kick up the opposition and they ridicule and they mock you and all that, right? Understand that the, uh, the bottom line issue, the goal is to get you to stop yeah. 
whatever you're doing. If they can't get you to stop, they will get you to slow down. Sometimes it's going to come in the form of stirring the disunity because that will disrupt. But notice in verse 6, they focused on what they were supposed to do. They did not allow distraction to come in. And because of that, it says, so built we the wall. And then notice, there was result. Okay? What began as something very feeble, very small, um, it looks like it was overwhelming. What happened now? It says, the walls were joined continuously around the whole perimeter. Okay? There was no more gap. No more breach in the wall. All that was fixed. That was one of the things. And then it says, onto the half thereof, because then they were able to then build up. They fixed what was disconnected and broken. Right? For completeness sake, it was now continuous. And then they built it up to the half height. Now that's tremendous progress in a short amount of time. Right? Now, but the word for there is important because it tells us because the people had a mind to work. All this could not be accomplished and done. All right? They cannot fix the wall. They cannot finish this work if they were not focused. They had a mind to work and they had to work, notice, together. Right? They have to work on this together. This focus had to be maintained in spite of all the external opposition that they were receiving. All right? Criticism, personal attacks, mocking, scorn, right? questioning their competence and their ability. Sambalat and Tobiah did as much as they could to stir up all the negativity. I just want to remind everyone, no, whatever someone says about you or your pastor or your church or whatever, it will, it will not hurt you unless you actually take it seriously. Okay? Any damage is because it's like this. They can throw as much poison as you, but until I drink it, it does nothing. Here, you'll see that when everyone focused on what the Lord had intended for them to do, progress was made. Okay? But notice the order. Completeness. You've got to cover all the gaps. You've got to cover all, right, all those areas that are missing, things that we need to put things in place. And then notice that was when they started building up. Right, it would have been very difficult to build up where there was a gap there and then can you imagine they built up to the half height and then there's this kind of hole in between. And sometimes we need to look around and say, look, what's missing in our ministries? What's missing in our teaching and our preaching? All right? Before we get deeper, we want to cover, make sure we cover all bases and then we build up. Now, as they did that, what happened? Progress was made. They were resolved. Look at verse 7. Now we see the fury of the opposition. But it came to pass that when Sembalat and Tobiah and the Arabians, okay, and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped. Right? You saw that again? How that the walls were being made up, the, the breaches, all the gaps and whatever were, were covered now. It says, Then they were very wroth, and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem to hinder it. Right? Again, what happens? You notice, how do you destroy your enemy? Simple. You keep doing what you're supposed to be doing instead of focusing on fighting them. Why? Because spiritual success drives them crazy. It does. And here, right, notice from the laughing ac accusations, the mischaracterization, all that, the criticism, questioning, competence, now they were very angry. It got them more upset. 
Okay, they conspired to together against the Jews, right? They threatened to attack them. And I want, I want us to notice something. Sometimes in the face of threats, right, you, you and I may allow ourselves to become overwhelmed if we're not careful. Because look at the names that were mentioned. Sambala of Samaria, that's up in the north. The Ammonites were on the east. It's where Jordan is today. Right? Down in the south were the Arabians. And then over the west, the Ashdodites. Do you see a picture there? They were surrounded. Surrounded. But if you and I focus on the fact that we are over outnumbered and we're surrounded, you will be overwhelmed. Okay? They were surrounded by tremendous opposition that can lead us to being overwhelmed if we're not careful. But Psalm 34 verse 7 tells us, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. And the more important thing is that instead of focusing on the enemy that is surrounded, uh, has surrounded us and that, we, that outnumber us, realize this, that the Lord is encamped around us and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Elisha pointed it out to his servant that, you know, all round, while they were surrounded by an army, said there were the chariots of fire all around. But you and I cannot see these things unless we use our spiritual eyes, eyesight, rather than our physical eyes. You don't have very good spiritual eyesight if you're not a dependent person who is increasing our dependence constantly through prayer. We go to the Lord and the time that we spend with Him that, you know what, we are able to see what He can see. And here, right, there was a fostering of, a, of confusion Right, verse 8, con conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem. What was the goal? And to hinder it. You see that? You see, right from the start, the whole issue, the whole goal was to what? Hinder the work. If you hinder it enough, people eventually give up. Yeah, they give up. Sometimes there's a new direction, as I said, and uh, members may decide, you know what? I'll wait and see. Maybe six months, seven months from now, Pastor Joel will just get discouraged and he'll give up. He'll try something else. I just have to ignore him for that period of time. Never mind what he says. We we'll drag our feet. And here, this was a more active form of resistance. They Conspired, they were going to, they threatened to come together in force to attack the city. Right? Now, the purpose was to hinder the work from completion. The word here has the idea of causing confusion. Right? If you look up Strong's concordance, and uh, uh, to cause confusion, disturbance, or error. Right? And the more confusion that the enemies can see among God's people, the less work gets accomplished. Which is why we must remember one thing, that in, it's within the New Testament church, right, that God establishes things that are very clear because God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Notice that? But of peace. As in all churches of the saints, this is characteristic of all New Testament churches of Jesus Christ. That God will be the author of peace in, their, in those churches, in those assemblies. Now, what did they do? Again, what is their response and their reaction to all this? Again, it goes back to prayer. I think you get the picture by now. All right? Every time there's a challenge, every time there's all right, a, a problem, whatever, we need to, that is the first place. Because so many times, people pray as a last resort. All right? We tried this, we tried that, everything we tried has failed. We finally get on our knees, we beg God, please help us. No, 
Each time they faced a challenge, the first thing they did, they got down on their knees, they prayed, but they also took action. Watching and praying unto the Lord, right? Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Now, notice the counter plan that Nehemiah set in motion. All right, they continue in prayer towards the Lord, but now they set watchmen on a 24 hours watch. There was rotation among the men, right? Different shifts to be vigilant. Amen. Now, we have a form of modern Christianity today that will seem to imply that doing this is a sin. Note this. They were watchful. Right? Can, may I remind everyone that it is a spiritual and character requirement in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that the bishop or the pastor of the church is to be vigilant. He's on guard. He's watchful. He is not, he is not a careless person. You contrast that to the church and ministry culture that we have today where the idea is, well, he used to be this nice guy that everyone loves, but he's spiritually careless. He is doctrinally careless. He is right, theologically careless and casual. They notice they set watch constantly. Right? They brought the matter in prayer also to the God who watches over them 24-7. Right? These men were there to watch to, to raise the alarm where there was a need, yeah. where there was a threat. Matthew 26 verse 41 tells us that it says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now this tells you, this is a basic requirement for every Christian. That we ought to be vigilant people. We ought to watch. Why? Because especially in the moments of our spiritual victories, you know what? We tend to get careless and we will fall flat on our face. Ephesians 6 verse 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Right? And notice, watching. Watching, being on guard. Actually, in other words, actually paying attention to what's going on around us. Okay, now, you will notice something that... Um, this wasn't something all everyone was involved with because they had to finish the work. But this was a task that was assigned to certain people to keep watch, right? To stay on guard because right, there would be the need to sound a warning at a certain time. Warnings are important. They're there for our safety. You and I would appreciate if someone came, rushed, rushed in right now into the hall and said, Fire! Fire! But how do we respond to that? Some will take heat and say, Oh, is there a fire? Let's get out here now. Let's mobilize. We get everyone out here to safety. Someone else will say, You know what? That's really judgmental of you. That's not nice. It's not it's so nasty. It's so negative. Oh, we have a the 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 one the, the my pet peeve, right? It's a term is, which is misused over in, in my country. Pastor, that's not edifying. Really? Do you know something? If I come in here and I tell you that your car is on fire, do you realize it doesn't matter if I'm your friend or your enemy? The only thing that matters is it's true. If it's false, fine. Ignore it. 
But you realize that even when your enemy is laughing at you, saying, hey, your car outside is on fire, you should really go and see it. I've already taken the video, I uploaded it, it's, it's hilarious. Do you realize, even if he's your enemy and he tells you that, if it's true, it's true. Yeah. Pastor, but so many times, what happens is in our cu- church culture today, we say, ah, you're saying that only that because you don't like me. Who cares? If it's true, you're in trouble. And we need to be vigilant, right? A, a, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband or one wife. Vigilant, sober. Right? Men who are drunk are usually half asleep or not aware of what's going on. This is vigilance of good behavior given to hospitality apt to teach. Alright, first Timothy chapter three verse two. First Peter five verse eight tells us what? Be sober, be vigilant. Now this is a general instruction to every believer. It says because notice you have an enemy, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. What do we do? Whom resist steadfast in the faith. You stand your ground, you resist him. Okay, usually people get it backwards. They flee from the devil when we're supposed to stand steadfast. And then what do we do? We try to resist lust, especially youthful lust, when we're told to flee youthful lust. We get it backwards. No wonder we are defeated so easily. Now, Can I say this? This is something in the New Testament, this is something for everybody to do, to be watchful, to be spiritually vigilant, not just so-called the men called of God and the pastors or the leaders, whoever, but everybody. How do I know that? Ephesians 6 verse 11. Ephesians 6 verse 11. Now pay attention to this. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now may I ask everyone, this whole armor, who was it issued to? The ultra spiritual Christians? The mature ones? All of us. Every single one of us. And may I remind you, you were issued a sword. Use it or lose it. Yes. One of the first things we, we learn in the army, all right, uh, and in, in my country, we are, all the men are enlisted, right? Used to be two and a half years mandatory service, and then after that, now it's two years, and I, I, I would have to serve uh, as a commander in the infantry even until I was, six, I was 40. Now, the first and most basic and important lesson is this, you always keep your rifle by your side. You never lose it. Never. You never let it out of your sight. That's why they always say, this is your wife. You take good care of her. You take good care of her and she will take good care of you. Right? First trick I learned was instead of leaving it around, we have a sling to sling it around our neck. If you ever have a question as to how you might lose it, you step in into the where the sling is, you will never lose it. They will have to cut someone will have to cut your leg off before they can take it away from you. Right, ladies, with your hand back, you can try that with your sling. Okay? You step in once you put your foot in there, you're not gonna lose it. But notice it's always to be by your side. And there would be to be watchful and to uh, in other words, can I say this? It is not optional. It is not optional for us to say, well, these guys, the men here, well, okay, they, I'm not contentious like them. We were never to be contentious people. But we are to contend for the truth. Right? And, And what do we use? The word of God. Oh, wait, 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 hang on, hang on. That's your sword. 
on, isn't it? The problem is that we sometimes reduce this book to being something that we deal with every day for devotional purposes, and it's just, it tells me all the nice, soft, fluffy things I feel good for the day when it has a lot more than just that. Okay, this has real steel in there. And understand this. You cannot say you know the Word of God if you do not know how to use it like a sword. Amen. Oh, but I'm not violent. You know, it's very interesting how when you examine the hymns that were written, that by the start of the 20th century, a lot of, there's very little talk or in the songs, in the lyrics about standing or fighting of victory anymore it shifted to more this oh how I love Jesus you know and that kind of thing and there is a softness and an effeminate spirit that has come in Comp- in contrast to the old hymns and we have to be vigilant to guard against that also because there has to be a proper balance Right? And here you're going to see that is the reason why you see each and every one of us is equipped with the word of God. It's not just certain people, right? But every body. It is standard issue equipment for everyone. And the only okay, notice the only reason we are not going to wield this or use this properly is because it is out of willful disobedience. Right? No excuse. Okay? Now, I understood this when I was in the infantry because when we are in a firefight and we are there in our defensive position, whoever, I expect everybody to my left and to my right and to be using their weapon when we need to. Alright? Because if they don't, that is a betrayal to the rest of us. We cover, we watch for each other's back. We cover each other. All right. We even actually on, on our we have cards and we will actually mark out our arc of fire to make sure that we interlock. We are overlapping with each other. We cover for each other. Okay. Now here, notice they made their watch. All right. They kept vigilant because of the impending attack. Okay, warnings are important and we must take heed. You are a very sim- simple-minded and a foolish person when you ignore this. Proverbs 23 verse 3 tells us, A prudent man foreseeth the evil, notice, and hideth himself. He will take measures to avoid the trouble. But the simple pass on and are punished. Alright, oh, the road there is, you know, the bridge there is down. Ah, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Ah! And then you're down. Foolish people will ignore this. All right? And when, when you are simple, in the, when the Bible calls you simple, it is not a compliment. Okay? It is not a compliment. It's not a good thing. Ladies, take note, please. Okay? Because you must understand there is a fundamental difference between men and women. And we were, all of us were created different as men and women. (laughs) By design, women were sensitive and trusting. God created a woman for Adam to be that way. Why? So she will submit to him. Okay? So, and she will be sensitive and you should be submissive to the Lord also. But in a world where there is evil, in a world where there are lies and deception, it becomes something that can be exploited by the devil. We saw that in Genesis chapter 3 when the serpent went in. He took advantage of that. 
Okay, and can I remind everyone we are no longer living in that kind of world before Adam fell. Because I meet a lot of people in church who are like that. They are simple. Simple to the point where it, they are foolish. Because why? They are very careless about things when they need to be discerning. Okay, because we live in a very different world and it's a very dangerous world. And so we need to be careful and vigilant and we need to test things. That's why we're told, prove all things, hold fast that which is, which is good. All right, now, so Proverbs 27 verse 12 also says this, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. It is almost exactly the same thing, repeated twice. Why? Because it's important. Now, Not all issues and problems are external. Yeah. Okay? Look at verse 10. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build a wall. Now, I want us to notice something here, that as the work was making progress and as they were building up, there were internal issues that have to be taken care of. Okay? Now this is not because that the, there was a problem with the work, but this has to do with that as they were doing the work, maintenance was needed. Example here was that it says the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed and there's much rubbish so that we're not able to build a wall. Now, in the course of building and construction and all that, one of the things that they had to deal with was the pre-existing rubble and rubbish that was there. Right? It's been over 70 years. It's been accumulating there. And you can't just sort of, well, we'll just step around this and we'll step over this and then we'll just continue and we ignore that. Okay? In other words, housekeeping is necessary. Okay? One of the things that, as, again, as an infantryman, when we dig in and we build, dig our trenches and we're going in, now we, we have to actually dig so that it's about chest height. That's a lot of soil to remove out of the ground. And one of the things we were taught was this you don't just dig and then throw it next to you. Because if you start digging deep enough, there's enough stuff piled up, it's going to fall right back and bury you. We have to pull, push this some distance back. Now, as they were doing this, and the rubble and all this rubbish was piling up, now it got more and more difficult. Why? The bearers of burdens, the ones who were carrying, can you imagine having to overcome all sorts of obstacles and then be up and then to get down and this was wearing them down. Okay? Now, where did the rubbish come from? A lot of this rubbish came from the past. When the city was attacked, it was under siege and then it was torn down and burned down. Okay? Now, sometimes there is all the baggage of the past. Your past, your previous history, our lives, or things that happened in church. And here, the message was very simple. Clear the rubbish. You gotta clear it out, right? You and I, some of us here today, there are things that have happened because of the past. They hinder us or they hold us back. They hinder us from moving forward or they may be holding us back. They may be hindering your growth. Baggage, your re past relationship, maybe with your parents, with your previous church or pastor, past failures, the failures that you think were other people's failures. Now, if you look at the next few verses, it led to a blindness. 
okay, an inability to see. Look at verse 10. Ah, sorry, verse 11. And our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. Now, what you could see here in verse 11 was that this actually cancelled out whatever they were trying to do in verse 9 when they set watch. Why? We're not talking about small piles of garbage. Imagine the garbage came up this high and they couldn't see over it. Now it led to a situation where they no longer had the foresight. They cannot see long, longer distances. And the enemies were saying, you know what, they're not going to know. We're going to come in from here, here, they can't see, and then, boo, they're going to surprise you because you can't see where the enemy is coming from. It's going to be a surprise attack. And as these things accumulate in our lives and here in, in Jerusalem, this creates a stressful situation for everyone. Verse 12 says, And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, from all places when ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Now, a number, many of them were living outside of Jerusalem. But every time they're going in, can you imagine they're going in to work in the morning? Now, the enemies all around them, they'll say, hey, we're going to come at you from all sides. You're not going to see us coming. Be careful. Watch. Watch out. We'll get you where you least expect it from a place that you can't see us coming from and they will come up right in front of you because you can't see us it will be right on top of you now this created a situation where this was now stirring anxiety and stress because right constant uncertainty becomes an issue Okay, now all of us here, we have to understand, we will be affected by the prospect of uncertainty. Which is why it's important you notice Nehemiah and, and, the, and, and in mobilizing the leaders, he wanted to stabilize the situation as quickly as possible. For that to happen, the walls had to be completed because that was not the main goal. Rebuilding the city and the temple was the main goal. Right? But they needed certain things to, you know, to ensure that there was some level of stability. The walls and the gates were necessary. The gates were there to control access in and out. Just as even in the New Testament church, you know, there is the gate and door of membership. Yeah. Only the saved should be allowed to enter. Amen. And what happened was this. He was trying to bring this stability, but the ones hindering it, you notice now they were stirring this thing. They know, why did they do this? They know that it works. It works on us. All right, so it says here, they, they kept repeating this over and over against 10 separate occasions, right, that they could come out and, and surprise attack them, come, boom, right on top of them. And I, I guarantee you one thing, men, even if you think, well, no problem, we can handle this, your wife will think otherwise. Why? Because for her, she's thinking, what about the children? All right? And men, this is one of the things I, I mentioned yesterday, you know, to, that as husbands, to give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, one of the great needs is that of security. That's not because she's being unspiritual or whatever. That is a need. And, and it, it, for a person who's caring for everyone's needs or whatever, security, stability is important. All right? And what we do as men is we offer what? Assurance. Security. And that was why, again, that's why you need the walls and the gate. Now, here, 
Again, what would be the response? Look at verse 13. Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords and their spears and their bows. All right? He took measures. He set them in the lower places behind the wall. Right? The wall was there for a defensive position, for protection. This was, now, some may argue, well, it's not much of a wall. I agree. It's only half height. Okay? It's only half height. But understand this. When you and I are involved in the work, we deal with things at different levels of progress. Every New Testament church is always a work in progress. All right? Don't join a church if you're not prepared to roll up your sleeves and get to work. It is a work in progress. It's no such thing as one that is all complete, it's everything nice, it's a five-star hotel. All right? It's always work. Now, but what they did was this. They set them in the lower parts, places behind the wall, and on the higher places. There were a few different high, higher positions, all right? And I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. Now notice one thing, he armed everybody. There was an immediate danger, an immediate threat, and what, they did, what did Nehemiah have to do? They had to stop work now. They had to deal with the imminent danger of a possible attack. They were on high alert for a period of time. Now the later part, if you read further, that they then went, they were then they started to stand down to half alert. Okay, but now we call this red alert. Okay, everybody was there, but notice something: they were fully committed. You see, their families were there. It's been understood a long time ago that men fight hardest when their families are at stake. They have a reason to fight. Okay? They have a reason to fight. Notice, and I looked and rose up, verse 14, and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not, af be not ye afraid of them. Now notice, remember the Lord which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Now, is it be not afraid? Why? Remember the Lord. Over and over in the Psalms, you're going to see Israel will rehearse the great and mighty acts of the Lord. How that he defeated right, Egypt to those ten plagues. How he led them across the Red Sea. How they walked on dry ground. Right? How in the wilderness he fed them with manna. When there was no food, they could not plant, they, they, you know, and all that. They rehearsed that over and over again. They reminded themselves what, what, how powerful and mighty God is. And here they say, he tells them, look, remember the Lord. Now, Nehemiah understood this because... All this time, God had opened the way from the time he was merely the butler to the king. Right? Sorry, he was his, uh, what do you call that? No, no, his butler, his uh, taster. Taster, John, good. That taster is expendable. He's just a nobody, he's expendable first to die if anyone tried to poison the king. The Lord opened the way how he, they had the resources and the authority to begin this work. And why, why was that necessary is this. You see, in times of danger and trial and, and a challenge and a time of crisis, many times we forget what God had been doing up to this point. We forget that he, is, he was able to take us through the last major problem, the last crisis, and there is a need for us to rehearse and to remind ourselves what the Lord has done because why faithful is He. And because He is faithful, what He took us through, He will take us through for the current problem that we're facing. So He reminds them, He says, remember. Right? And then not only that, but to 
Fight. Simple word, fight. Dearly beloved, there will be a time where every single one of us must stand and fight. Okay? Now, I am not generally a confrontational person. I am not a brawler. I don't like fighting. But over the years, as I understood this truth and I examined myself, I, under, I also came to understand one thing. That is true of me, but it's not in absolute terms. It's not 100%, because I realize I will fight for the people I care about. I will fight for the church that I love. I will fight because there are things in here, the truth and the doctrines that are in here are not negotiable. All right? They're not negotiable. It's not up for debate. And I will have to stand for that. I don't have any other option. I will have to stand and fight for my wife, for my children. And that was what Nehemiah said. He said, for your brethren. Right, so for your sons, for your daughters, your wives, your houses. Our entire way of life. And today, I just, we probably already ran out of time, but I want, as we close here, I want us to consider this, right? Who today will understand that we need to stand and fight for what's important to us? Okay? Now, I admit one thing. People always stand and fight for what's important. And the question is, sometimes, if they will not take up a just and godly and spiritual cause, that's because they have other things that are more important. If you are in that situation, can I encourage you? Come before the Lord and align your heart with what's important to the Lord. The Lord's not going to align to that, okay, to where you are. You need to get in line with Him. All right? I'm not, and I'm not talking about whatever position the, the ch- this church may, may hold. I'm talking about we have to line up with this. Okay? Because there are things that are worth fighting for. It says, fight. Listen, for your brethren. For this church. In telling them that, he's telling everyone, you know something? They are going to attack. You have to make a decision. You either stand your ground or you leave town. Which is what, that's the option that they have. They run because it's dangerous. Get out. Alright, and he says, why? Because there are things that are at stake. Your sons. Your daughters, your wife. Okay? And realize this. We will have to fight, but it it is a fact that we fight for what is valuable and what's important to us. But can I remind everyone that it was Paul, the Apostle Paul, who reminded everyone, the, the, the elders in Ephesus, in Acts chapter 20, that it was God who purchased this church with what? Money? US dollars? With his own blood. Amen. Now, we need to get a hold of that truth, you know, because if he purchased this, that church with his own blood, And we keep singing, his blood is precious. Is it precious to you? Hmm? Dearly beloved, is it precious to you? Are your uh, brethren, those who have been begotten by the blood of Jesus Christ, are they precious to you? Are they? If they are, why won't you fight for them? Why won't you stand together 
right? As they did in chapter 3, side by side, all around the city as they were building up. Right? Because it is worth fighting for. Amen. Today, for some of us here, my question to you is this. Is your marriage worth fighting for? If it is, what are you doing about it? Hmm? I was greatly encouraged by what I heard about Cedric. He finally had the conviction to fight for what was important to him. Millie. And he was not prepared to let her go or lose her a second time. He did what was necessary. Now, can I say this? You, for a man to do that for a woman, I understand. We all understand that. Many of you say, oh, so romantic. <laughs> but, what about for his bride? Hmm? This church that you're in, is it worth fighting for? Because your family, your children, your wife, everything, it's all at stake. And it ought to be that because it, everything's at stake here and uh, everything's tied together, our futures are all tied together, we fight the hardest. Yes. We ought to be the most dedicated when, when it comes to dealing with this. Right? But realize this, that we can never be without problems or opposition. It will come. But you see, over and over again, it was overcome by prayer and also taking measures collectively, corporately. Okay? I understand Jerusalem at the time is not a church. But you will see, corporately, they work together as the people of God, and God helped them to overcome each and every one of that. Now, while driving the enemies and the opposition crazy. All right? As we close today, I just want to challenge everyone. Are you fighting for the right things? Are you afraid to take a stand? Your refusal to do so says a lot about what is important to you. Yeah. Right? But I want to also challenge everyone. When we fight, you notice it was a spiritual fight. Yeah. Our weapons or warfare are not carnal but spiritual some of us you may have to adjust because we are hot headed we are fiery people and you know something you may fight the wrong battle alright I wonder where are we this morning alright let's pray Father we thank you Lord for even this time in the word and the Lord for challenging us